In the last couple of videos in this series, numbers 13 and 14, we introduced the Schwarzschild metric for a non-rotating, uncharged black hole. We discussed the fact that with that metric, an outside observer in what we've been calling the red frame will measure someone who's falling into a black hole to be slowing down to zero velocity before reaching the event horizon. And they will never measure them accurately to have passed through the Schwarzschild radius. We illustrated that situation like this, where the brown curve represents an object with mass falling into a black hole. And we had a similar kind of diagram for a beam of light, shown here in green, which was also measured by the outside red observer never to pass through the event horizon. However, in the experience of the person or the object with mass falling into the black hole, they themselves did not measure there to be any delay in their travel to and then through the event horizon. In other words, they experienced smooth motion without any real hiccup, and they passed through the Schwarzschild radius without feeling anything different. They are essentially in free fall, in locally flat space-time, and feel no forces on them, at least unless or until tidal forces become appreciable. The extent of those tidal forces at the event horizon depends on the closeness of the event horizon to the central mass or singularity. The Schwarzschild radius RS will be given by 2gm over c squared. In other words, for a black hole with a high central mass, capital M, the event horizon will be a long way off from that central mass singularity. So the gravitational field lines at the event horizon will likely be almost parallel in that region and the tidal forces will consequently be relatively small. On the other hand, for a black hole with a small mass, capital M, the Schwarzschild radius will be that much smaller. And so at the event horizon, the closeness to the central mass singularity will mean that the tidal forces will be considerable, and anyone falling in there will be stretched lengthways and also compressed sideways. It's the proximity to the central mass or singularity that will determine the experience stretching or compressing from the tidal forces. But in terms of velocity and other aspects of the motion experienced by the object entering the event horizon, there will be nothing unusual as far as they are concerned. When we discussed this earlier, we said that the strange velocity effects measured by the red at rest observer at the Schwarzschild radius were only really due to what might be called a coordinate singularity. This was a consequence of using a particular measuring system or metric, and those effects could be removed by using a different set of coordinates, a different metric. The way in which changes in the coordinate system could be done had been discussed early on when we first started thinking about special relativity. And in this video, we shall discuss a very important change of coordinates to a different and very useful metric. Before we do, however, here is a short revision of what's been discussed so far about the Schwarzschild metric and some of the measurement issues surrounding it. If you recall, before introducing the black hole mass, we initially discussed a very straightforward Cartesian type set of coordinates which could be used to measure a flat two-dimensional Minkowski spacetime x and t. We assumed that the velocity of light was equal to 1, and we drew these yellowish dashed lines passing through the origin and at 45 degrees to each axis. The direction of these served as a guide to the direction of any light travel anywhere in this particular flat spacetime, Although more specifically, the two particular lines shown here relate to communication to or from the event at the origin itself. Recall these lines, when drawn anywhere in the space-time, a light cone. The name was on account of the fact that if we had two dimensions of space rather than the one here, we could draw it with a conical shape at each event in the space-time, such as at the origin here. In fact, every event in the space-time can be thought of as having a kind of light cone to represent how light could travel to or from that event. With this one-dimensional space and one of time, we could have a light cone here, or here, or anywhere. We then moved on in our discussion to a space-time metric, which, if we had three dimensions of space, 
was based on spherical polar coordinates. Here's the spatial representation for that, which illustrates the three spatial variables r, theta, and phi. However, for simplicity of drawing when introducing the fourth dimension of time, we again consider just the one dimension of space, the radius r, and we essentially ignore theta and phi because of the symmetry of the situation. At this stage, we could have legitimately used a Cartesian-type grid for r and t. This was still measuring flat space-time, and that would be true even if we'd been in four-dimensional space-time with this metric tensor. The curvature here in the metric tensor is in the theta and phi parts of the spherical polar coordinates, and not necessarily in the space-time itself. The fact that we were only looking at the radius and time parts of this metric meant that those coordinates were also what we might call Cartesian-like, with a metric tensor given by minus one zero zero one. However, that was before we placed a mass, a high value of mass, at the origin. Once we did that, our simple space-time then became curved, and we had to use a different metric, a different set of coordinates, which now could not really be a simple Cartesian grid. Here is a depiction of that space-time with the high concentrated mass m positioned at the origin. It only shows the main axes and not the grid, and the coordinate measures have been shown here in red. The different metric that we used to describe this space-time was the Schwarzschild metric, and its coordinates were once again based on the spherical symmetry of the system so that we only really needed to write down the first four entries in the metric tensor like this. No theta or phi to worry about. Furthermore, on account of the fact that the Schwarzschild radius rs was given by 2gm over c squared, we were then able to write the metric tensor in a slightly simpler looking form, namely this, or even this. Now this metric, in whichever way it was written, was helpful in describing some things as far as RT measurements made by an outside observer were concerned. But it also meant that other things seemed to go a little haywire. To illustrate this, let's look again at that space-time which uses RT measurements in the Schwarzschild metric. The mass capital M is at the origin R equals zero and T equals zero, but no light directions have been added just yet. It's also worth reminding ourselves that, on account of the spherical symmetry, we're now only really considering the right-hand side of this diagram for positive values of R in this region. The Schwarzschild radius was illustrated like this, as we consider the black hole and its event horizon shell to be travelling in time, giving vertical lines on this diagram. We're also able to say that the Schwarzschild metric meant that the space-time interval was given by this expression, or of course it could be written like this. However, we then found that, according to the mathematics, for a beam of light coming in radially, its velocity decreased to zero as it approached the event horizon, as measured by the outside observer using the red frame of reference, and this meant that its trajectory in our space-time diagram would look something like this. This apparent phenomenon was easy to illustrate mathematically by making the space-time interval ds equal to zero, and therefore light-like, and hence relevant to a beam of light. Putting ds squared here equal to zero eventually gives the equation for dr by dt, the velocity of the light as measured by the outside observer, and it is dependent on the radius r. It can be seen here that the velocity of light is measured to be equal to c, when the red r is extremely large, but measured to fall at distances closer to the Schwarzschild radius, eventually getting to zero when r equals rs. The mathematics also showed the consequence of this, namely that the trajectory of the ray of light heading towards the central mass would look something like this, as measured by the outside red observer. The green line here shows the trajectory of a beam of light in this space-time, as measured using this reference frame. At large distances away from the large mass, the light is measured to have a velocity of 1, the speed of light here and so the line is at 45 degrees to the axes. However, 
as it gets closer to the central mass, it slows down and is measured never actually to reach the event horizon. We have this as a light cone here, 45 degrees, then this, and so on and so on. Now, given that a basic tenet of relativity is the constancy of the speed of light, this quirk in the Schwarzschild measuring system seems particularly unsatisfactory. It's annoying that a plot of light travel in these coordinates seems to show that the speed of light is not constant, even though I suppose the reality is that it is only being measured to be changing rather than actually changing. What would be good would be if we could find a new set of coordinates, a new metric for the region around the black hole, which would make sure that the outsider always measured the speed of light to be the same everywhere. Other things might go even more haywire, of course, but at least the velocity of light would be constant. Now, in an earlier video, we talked a lot about changing from one coordinate system to another. We had equations like this for the two-dimensional space, not space-time, remember. And here we imagine changing, say, from the red x1, x2 spatial coordinates to the blue x1 tilde, x2 tilde spatial coordinates using some function or other. These, if you recall, are meant to represent the functions that would change one coordinate measure into another. And that's what we need to do here in this situation where we have a large central mass, capital M. We need to find the functions that will change the red R and T into some other variables such that the velocity of light is not measured to change when those variables are used. It should be possible to convert this red Schwarzschild RT system of coordinates into a new blue system in which the velocity of light will be measured by those new coordinates to be the same everywhere in this space-time, even near the black hole. This will give us a new metric, of course, a new system by which measurements can be made in this space-time around the black hole. Now, this idea was suggested fairly soon after general relativity was introduced in 1915, but it wasn't until around 1960 that it was really developed. In what is commonly called the Kruskal metric, what I've designated as the red R and T Schwarzschild coordinates will be replaced by two new blue variables, which we will call RK and TK, the K being for Kruskal. These are the functions needed to bring about that change from red Schwarzschild to blue Kruskal, and they can be shown to be given by these equations. Notice that I've kept the colour coding here, red for Schwarzschild R and T, and blue for the new Kruskal coordinates. I've also kept the velocity of light C in the equations, although it could easily be put equal to 1. Now, you can look up the mathematics of how these functions, rk and tk, come about if you wish. It is somewhat tortuous and laborious, and even perhaps slightly problematic. But if you spend a bit of time on it, it's possible to see the general gist of how it goes. It's done in a series of stages, changing the red rt to a new set of coordinates via one formula, then converting that new set to a different set with another conversion formula, and then doing that kind of thing again and again. Eventually, you end up with the final result for the Kruskal metric. I ought to say, however, that it is possible to derive the Kruskal metric directly from Einstein's field equations without any problematic issues, although still far too difficult for us even to think about at this stage. More importantly for us is that we should try to delve into this new metric and see some of the consequences of it, apart simply from having light rays which can be drawn at 45 degrees everywhere in our diagrams. In other words, what would measurements look like as things approach a black hole? Now, we're not going to try and justify or explain these conversion formula, but we can at least think a little bit about the consequences of them. Notice that here I've put the values of RS in red as well, simply to help pick it out more easily as we discuss things in a moment. But I think the first thing to notice about the actual conversion equations is the fact that when the red measurement R is equal to the Schwarzschild radius, RS, then these two brackets are each equal to zero. 
and they will dominate each expression, overwhelming whatever the exponential or the hyperbolic terms can do. Now, you can check that out if you want. But what I'm saying is, in these new coordinates, the event horizon, when red r equals rs, could be said to be at rk equals 0 and tk equals 0. So that in these new blue crustal coordinates, the event horizon is not just a place, red r equals rs, which travels through time, but rather it seems to be an event with a definite place at a definite time, rk equals 0 and tk equals 0. That's what it seems to be at this stage, and it seems very strange. It seems that in fiddling the velocity of light to be measured to be the same everywhere, we have done something else which is a bit weird. And there'll be more to say on that later, so let's move on and try for the moment to picture what's going on here. Obviously, the origin of the blue RKTK frame here will not now be where the black hole singularity itself will be at the time TK equals zero, but rather it will be where the event horizon is situated. Now from that, one might at first naively think that we ought to position the mass singularity at some negative RK, say, here. But we won't, because as you'll see in a moment, the new coordinates are not as simple as that. There's more weirdness. Looking again at the conversion equations for this new Kruskal metric from the red RT system, we would probably want to say that these equations only really apply outside the event horizon. Why do I say that? Well, because if red R were to be made less than RS, in other words, inside the event horizon according to the old red coordinates, then this division would be less than 1. And we would have a negative number inside both of these brackets. This would give us the square root of a negative number. So we'll stay clear of that for the moment, even though in fact we could go somewhat down that route if the expressions in the brackets are reversed. In other words, we could actually use 1 minus r over rs in the brackets, but more on that later. For the moment, then, we will restrict any discussion to outside the event horizon, with the old red r being bigger than rs, so that these brackets remain positive, and that problem doesn't arise. You may also have realised by the presence of the Koch and Shine functions in the conversion equations that these new Kruskal coordinates will be hyperbolic. We discussed this kind of thing a little bit in an earlier video and we'll go over it to some extent again here as we work through a few things in relation to these Kruskal coordinates. So that's the coordinate conversion. And it's not too difficult from that to derive the Kruskal metric for those coordinates. Although it looks rather strange here with an rs cubed in it. We won't go through the calculation of this, but if we take it and compare it with the Minkowski metric for flat spacetime minus 1001, we can see that we seem to have curvature in the spatial or radial coordinates and also in the time coordinates but still no cross terms. It should be clear from this that the space-time interval in this Kruskal metric will then be given by just two terms for this two-dimensional space-time, namely this. Or with the velocity of light specifically included, it would be this. Now this expression for the space-time interval can easily be used to confirm that in this metric the velocity of light is always measured to have the same value and is equal to 1 in our system. And to see this, we would first assume that the metric is describing light. In other words, we want a light-like space-time interval, and that means putting ds squared equal to 0. Rearranging the resulting equation would then give this. The fact that these two brackets are equal to one another means that we can cancel them, rearrange things, take the square root, and we would then get drk by dtk equals the velocity of light c, or 1 if you use the other formula. And that was, in a sense, the whole point of this exercise, at least in the way that I introduced it. 
This means that we can not only put the yellow central light cone lines in at 45 degrees in this blue frame of reference, this Kruskal frame, but we can also say that at any point in this space-time we will have the velocity of light measured to be equal to 1, if measured using these Kruskal coordinates, and that is despite the presence of the black hole. The light cone of any event will look the same in all places and at all times, with 45 degree angles. We should also realise that we have no way, at least at the moment, of putting the central mass m on this diagram. The origin, rk equals 0 and tk equals 0, is in some way or other the event horizon. But where or whether we can position the mass m, which is the black hole singularity, is not yet clear. The Kruskal metric will take some time to get our head around. We'll simply have to accept that the new coordinates rk and tk, which are calculated from the Schwarzschild coordinates, are legitimate and can be used, along with many other possibilities of course, to measure events in the space-time around a black hole of this type. The event horizon of the black hole will be, in some ways, at the origin and all rays of light can be drawn at 45 degrees anywhere. Before we move on to look more closely at these coordinates and how they can help us understand some of the baffling stuff that we've looked at so far, I ought to say that these two transformation equations can obviously be manipulated to produce other equations by applying some simple mathematical relationships, such as these. You should recall that this is the hyperbolic equivalent of sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. It's from circular geometry, and this of course is the definition of the hyperbolic tangent. If we apply these two equations to our conversion formula for rk and tk, we would get these relationships, which we won't discuss in any detail, but just take note that they exist. So. We have quite a lot of equations which relate to these Kruskal coordinates and the old red R and T. And this may seem daunting, but they are simply multiple relationships which came from manipulating the basic conversion formulae. You should recall that the equation of an hyperbola is, in terms of x and y, x squared minus y squared is equal to r squared, where r is some constant for the particular hyperbolic curve. In other words, if we look at these equations for the whole range of r and t, running from positive to negative, the right-hand side is constant for each r value, and so we kind of have a whole family of hyperbolic curves, a bit like this. For the moment, however, we only want to be considering the region in the positive red r direction, and also outside of the event horizon, in other words, for red R greater than Rs. And that means we're looking at this equation, which will relate to this region, and only to these curves, at least for the moment. So, let's imagine plotting the Kruskal equation just for R greater than Rs, and plotting it in red. It would simply give us this graph. We are in our new blue Kruskal measuring system, which will ensure that the velocity of light is everywhere measured to be equal to 1. And the red hyperbola here are, in some ways, representative of the old Schwarzschild red R and red T within this blue frame of reference. They are, in some ways, lines of constant red R, though not quite as you'll see. Now, when we looked a little bit into hyperbolic coordinates in an earlier video, number 13, we essentially took Cartesian-type coordinates, x and t, and then looked at this relationship, x squared minus t squared equals r squared, where r was some constant. And the solutions to this equation suggested the existence of another variable, omega, such that x equals r cosh omega, and t equals r shine omega. And all of that led us to think about hyperbolic coordinates in R and omega, where R represented distance and omega represented time. However, with these Kruskal coordinates, instead of x squared minus t squared equals R squared, we have something rather more complicated. 
And our solutions, instead of simply being x equals r cosh omega and t equals r shine omega, are also a bit more complicated, namely these. The omega from the earlier simple analysis, which then became the labels for the radial lines cutting through the hyperbole, is now a little more complicated, as shown by this bracket. This is certainly proportional to the red t, and we could rescale this and give it a different letter, say t prime or t tilde or something, but I'm not going to. For simplicity, I'm just going to label the omega of our hyperbolic coordinates as red t, the time measured in the Schwarzschild coordinates. And I'll put some numbers on the lines which are drawn just to illustrate how we measure positive and negative time in this red system. You can remember that there is an implied scaling factor if you wish, but it won't really make any difference to our discussion. We will take these as lines of constant red t. Similarly, the r from the simple analysis, which then became the labels for the hyperbole, is now different and is even more complicated, as shown by this bracket. We can say, however, that the expression inside the bracket here is certainly very much dependent on the red r and increases with it. It would need a much more complicated rescaling to produce some kind of r dashed or r tilde that we could legitimately use. However, I'm simply going to label the hyperbole as the red r because that is the dominant variable inside the bracket. If we ever need more detail, we will refer back to the bracket in order to explain things. As I say, we could find a way of rescaling things, but that would be a lot of work and is unnecessary here for this descriptive discussion. So here's our situation with regard to these blue Kruskal coordinates and the old red Schwarzschild coordinates, at least as far as I'm discussing things. Let's be clear. We will be making measurements using the Schwarzschild red R and T but we can plot those measurements on what is, in some ways, a different kind of graph paper, namely the hyperbolic lines with the radial lines intercepting them. Granted, these measurements will have that simplification or approximation of the scaling which has just been mentioned, but the patterns that will emerge will be the same as if the scaling had been done. OK. We have hyperbolic lines measuring the red R values increasing to the right, like this. But which one of these red hyperbole, if any, corresponds to the event horizon? In other words, which of them, if any, represents R equals RS in the old red coordinate system? Well, if you think about it, it must be the ultra-tight hyperbola here which I'll show as these two thick red lines, which are virtually straight. They are the lines of these light paths which relate to communication to and from the blue Kruskal origin. Why do I say that these lines represent the hyperbola R equals RS? Well, we showed a moment ago from the hyperbolic equations that the origin of the Kruskal coordinate system, in other words, when RK equals zero and TK equals zero, must be where the red r equals rs, so that this whole square root bracket is equal to zero. And that means that on our graph, the origin here is the event horizon. Or to put it another way, this point or event at the blue origin must lie on the hyperbola which has the value of red r equals rs. And this means we can write in r equals rs for every part of these two thick red lines, or what is really one very tight bending hyperbola. These two thick red lines represent the event horizon in these blue Kruskal coordinates. If we do this, namely make these lines r equals rs, we might as well make all the other hyperbole have more sensible values than 1, 2, 3, etc., Something like nRS, 2nRS, and so on, where n is some large number. This might look awkward, but it is a way of saying that these hyperbole represent increasing values of red r, the difference between each one being some probably large whole number of rs. However, there's something else special about these two thick red lines, or rather this one rather tight hyperbola. 
When we discussed hyperbolic coordinates early on, this line was omega equals plus infinity. And so in these Kruskal hyperbolic coordinates, the upper line, the one going along the velocity of light line, represents red time t equals plus infinity. And the lower one represents a red time of minus infinity. That means we can write those figures alongside the lines as well. Now, if all of this is getting a bit confusing, then think of it this way. We started with the Schwarzschild metric for a black hole positioned at the origin of a two-dimensional space-time red R and red T, where the Schwarzschild radius was marked Rs. We then somehow transformed these coordinates to the Kruskal coordinates Rk and Tk, shown here in blue. And this had the effect that light rays would always have to be drawn at 45 degrees, but it also had the effect that the old red coordinates were distorted on this Kruskal scale into hyperbole, something like this. In doing this, we have kind of forced the old red coordinates to fit into the new blue Kruskal coordinate system by distorting them. This then allows us to make measurements in this space-time using either type of coordinate system, we can plot things using the old red RT measurements on what is a kind of hyperbolic graph paper, or we can use what looks like the more straightforward blue RKTK system. We're in the Kruskal coordinates, RK and TK, but we are free to plot or measure events on this sheet using the values measured in the old red R and T, providing we use the distorted or rather hyperbolic coordinates. We also realise that in these Kruskal coordinates, the position of the event horizon is so affected by the transformation that instead of it being a place which produces a vertical line as it travels through time, which it was in the old system, it has become the two red lines for red t equals plus infinity and red t equals minus infinity. Simplistically, though, it seems that the event horizon is somehow now tied to infinite times, and we might ask the question, where in this whole picture do we have the event horizon at more normal times, at finite times, as measured in the red RT system? And that's a moot point, but if you need an answer, I suppose you might say that it must be somewhere around here, between the red times of minus and plus infinity, in the infinitesimally small region where this event horizon hyperbola turns around and time changes from negative to positive. Anyway, providing we check back with the formula when needed, on account of the approximations that we made, we can use this hyperbolic graph paper, this version of the red Schwarzschild coordinates, these red coordinates, to measure the distance r from the event horizon and have the added advances that light will always be seen in this picture to be travelling at the same speed and not slowing down near the horizon. We can always draw it at 45 degrees. I think probably the next question to ask, however, is where on this diagram is the region inside the event horizon? Where is the region in which red R is less than Rs? Well, to think about that, we need to go back to the Kruskal conversion equations. When the red R is less than Rs, then these brackets become negative and we have the square root of a negative number. Or do we? Actually, the mathematics of hyperbolic geometry takes this into account. It shows that this region, the one that we discussed a moment ago, deals with situations where the hyperbolic equation says x squared minus t squared equals r squared, where the right-hand side is positive. On the other hand, this upper region deals with the situation where it says x squared minus t squared equals minus r squared, so that the right-hand side here is negative. It's this type of equation which describes events inside the Schwarzschild radius. In other words, when red r is less than rs. Now we could go into the mathematics of all that, but we will simply assume that events inside the Schwarzschild radius would be measured using coordinate lines like these in the upper quadrant. These are once again hyperbolic lines of constant little r. And as we go up in this quadrant, it is this r that is decreasing. 
We'll talk in a minute about the fact that this red R has become a measurement of time here inside the event horizon, but if we treat it simply as R, we can then say that lines of constant red T will then be angle straight lines like this. Also, if we recall that the origin of the blue crustal coordinates represents the event horizon, R equals RS, then these red hyperbolae in the upper quadrant, which are inside the event horizon, must be decreasing as we move upwards on the graph. They decrease from a red value R of RS at the crustal origin, down to a red value of zero at the singularity. We can therefore say that something like this hyperbola will probably represent r equals zero, the singularity. Let's assume that this is indeed the hyperbola which represents r equals zero, and we'll make it stand out a bit. We'll shade in the area behind it, which I suppose doesn't really exist. OK, that's as far as we'll go in describing these coordinates. We'll not discuss these regions, as arguably they have no real physical significance. In what follows, we'll be thinking about this region as representing outside the event horizon of the black hole, and this region as representing inside, with red R having become measurement of time, and red T a measurement of distance within this region. Now before we start to explore what the various diagrams for light or objects travelling towards the event horizon look like on this kind of graph, you need to try and feel comfortable about all this. You need basically to come to terms with this diagram. I don't mean fully understand it, but be comfortable with the fact that an event on it can be measured either by using the blue RKTK coordinates or on what we might call the hyperbolic graph paper using the red RT coordinates. The beauty of this diagram, as we shall see, is that as we're likely to have high velocities near a black hole, we can explore what various trajectories might look like, confident in the knowledge that the velocity of light will always behave sensibly when plotted on this kind of graph paper, whether using the Kruskal blue coordinates or the distorted hyperbolic Schwarzschild coordinates. Hopefully that will become clear as we discuss a number of situations in a moment. The next thing to do, therefore, will be to explore various scenarios and see if these coordinates can help us to understand what's going on near a Schwarzschild black hole. When, earlier on, we discussed the Schwarzschild metric, and imagined using it to make measurements in the space-time around a concentrated mass or black hole, we found a number of strange results. Not least the fact that if a beam of light was sent towards a black hole, then someone using these coordinates would measure the light never to have reached the event horizon, let alone to pass through it and go towards the singularity. The green curve here is a plot of the distance-time trajectory of a beam of light travelling from infinity directly towards a black hole, and that illustrated clearly. We found a similar result for a freely falling mass travelling towards a black hole, although in that case we didn't derive the actual formula. The brown curve here again illustrates that trajectory. Now I suppose it would be possible to make some sense of such seemingly strange results if we worked through the detail of the mathematics surrounding the Schwarzschild metric. It is, after all, the mathematics that's producing this apparent peculiarity. However, using what we're now calling Kruskal coordinates, which keep the velocity of light looking constant at a 45 degree line on these diagrams, it is possible to discuss a good number of such bizarre situations and make immediate sense of them, or at least get a better picture of what is really going on. And in what follows, we will mention various scenarios jumping from one to another. Some will simply be statements of fact, which will picture what we've already done, and so should be fairly obvious. Others will be a little more analytical, thinking through what happens when and why. All of them will look at the scenarios through the use of crustal coordinates and light signals which travel at 45 degrees on the diagram, remembering, of course, that any light signals we want to imagine must travel upwards on such diagrams, forward in time, and at 45 degrees. Firstly, let's consider an object A, 
travelling directly towards a black hole. This is essentially the brown mass curve here. The one-dimensional picture of this situation could be pictured like this in the blue system, where the object A is an unpowered spaceship in free fall. It could, I suppose, have its engines firing at times, giving some gentle acceleration or deceleration now and again, but the overall motion is towards the black hole, so we'll assume that it is unpowered and in free fall on a geodesic. The event horizon should probably not be shown as a circle or sphere in this particular kind of diagram, as R is really any and every radial direction, but I think you get the picture. In our crustal coordinates, we could plot such a journey using this brown trajectory, which shows the spaceship A heading towards the black hole and into the singularity as time goes on. In the blue crustal coordinates, it can be seen actually to pass through the event horizon and continue on to the singularity. Now, we haven't explored exactly how crustal coordinates would map out an object which was in free fall. In other words, exactly what the shape of this would be. But we'll assume that it will be a bit like this, an approximately straight line which may have some slight curving. Delving into that mathematics is not important for us. Suffice to say that in free fall, it will eventually reach the event horizon and then ultimately the singularity. And these blue crustal coordinates will show that. However, from simple observation of this diagram, it, it should be obvious that using the red coordinates with this trajectory, the object will reach the event horizon at a red time t of plus infinity. That would be how an outside observer using the red coordinate system would measure things. The moving object is seen here reaching the red line marked t equals plus infinity, which means that as far as the outside observer is concerned who uses those co coordinates, the object will never actually reach that point. It will never be measured to reach the thick red line, which represents the event horizon. If you like, this doesn't happen as far as the red observer is concerned. However, if we interpret this brown trajectory from measurements made in the blue crustal coordinates, it clearly tells a different story. It shows that in reality the object will pass through the event horizon, with no sense of time passing any more slowly than usual. The whole brown trajectory shown here, and any readings made using blue crustal coordinates, would confirm this. Note also that if after passing through the event horizon the spaceship wanted to turn back and try to avoid the singularity, it couldn't. If, once through the event horizon, it fired its engines to obtain the fastest speed possible, even close to the speed of light at almost 45 degrees, it would end up in this direction, never actually being able to cross back over the event horizon boundary and so it would still be heading towards the singularity. It is doomed. The argument being, of course, that this arrow cannot be at 45 degrees. The spaceship is travelling here at less than the speed of light, and so it will eventually, much higher up on this graph, hit the singularity at red r equals zero. In other words, once behind the event horizon at r equals rs, it is impossible for anything to escape. And a similar kind of thing would be true for a beam of light. It is shown here in green, and you should be able to see that it is drawn as a straight line at 45 degrees on this diagram. Remember, the speed of light was forced to be equal to 1 everywhere in crustal coordinates, so this use of a straight line is definitely appropriate. By the same simple analysis that we did for the brown line, it should be obvious that the outside observer who is using the red frame of reference, what we now call these parabolic coordinate lines, would measure the light to take an infinite time to reach the event horizon and never be measured to pass through it. This is because the red measurement of time at the horizon is t equals plus infinity. On the other hand, the reality is that the light will actually pass through the event horizon without incident, and in these crustal coordinates, this is still drawn to be at 45 degrees in that region, meaning that the velocity of light will be measured by these coordinates to be constant all the way to the singularity. 
You should take note, of course, just in case you are wondering, that this diagram cannot take into account the photon sphere. We're dealing here only with the radial direction, and so no angles theta or phi can come into this kind of simple analysis. A photon going into the black hole along a radial line, like the green line here, is bound to end up at the singularity, and there's no question of it being in temporary orbit in the photon sphere. Don't forget as well that the red coordinate inside the event horizon is a time, not a place. The future red time of the singularity cannot be avoided, and once anything passes through the event horizon, it cannot escape. It has passed the point of no return. OK, so now let's consider the fairly trivial case of two observers, A and B, who in their own spaceships are both falling into the black hole one after another. A first and B second, probably following their own individual geodesic with no engines firing. We'll be ignoring the fact that the red coordinates will measure both of these spaceships never to reach the event horizon. That's something we will simply now assume. Rather, we will focus on how they might communicate with each other as they fall into the black hole. The one-dimensional picture of this situation could be this. Obviously, A can see B behind them from the light that travels from B to A. And this would be one form of communication, simply seeing, or we could be talking about sending messages by radio waves. Similarly, B can see A in front of them from light that travels from A to B. In observing one another, of course, they would see the other person at a somewhat earlier time on account of the finite velocity of light. That's always true when we observe distant events. And the same would be true about radio signals that might be sent, of course. Here are two possible trajectories for A and B in these crustal coordinates, shown once again as brown, almost straight lines and labelled A and B. It should be obvious from looking at this that the brown A line represents an object in front of the one on the brown B trajectory. What I mean is, consider any red time, say this red dashed radial line, Everything on that line is considered in these red coordinates to happen at the same time. It should be obvious there from this that A will be measured to have a smaller red R than B. It is on a different hyperbola. It's in front. Or alternative, of course, even if you take a particular blue time, TK, everything on this horizontal dashed line is considered in the blue coordinates to happen at the same time. And once again, the blue RK value of A would obviously be measured to be smaller than the blue RK of B. All measuring systems agree that A is in front of B, obviously, and they are both travelling inwards. We may return later to this idea of where they are at the same time, but for now we'll think about light or messages that travel from one to the other. To save clutter, let me take away the blue RKTK axes, as they are easier to imagine if we need them, and consider first the situation when the spaceship B was here at this place and time, this event. This event could be measured either by using the red RT system or by using the blue RKTK system, and they would have very different values, of course, which would be related to one another via the various Kruskal formulae. Whilst at that event or place time, B could see light or could get a message from A. But of course that information would have left A when it was at this place and time, a little earlier. This is because of the 45 degree line needed to represent light travel from A to B. Furthermore, when A was at this particular place and time, when it sent out the light message to B, it would have seen B as being much further away from the singularity at an even earlier time here. It should be obvious that all information from one observer to the other must travel along these 45 degree lines parallel to the thicker red lines of the red coordinate system, and it move, must of course move upwards in this diagram. To put all that another way, if when B was at this place time, he sent a message to A, 
then the earliest he could expect a reply would be when he arrived at this place time. Now the light signals or messages illustrated so far in this diagram take place outside the event horizon, but the same would be true when one or both of the travellers had gone through the event horizon, providing we think about things in the Kruskal coordinates. So let's suppose that now B is inside the event horizon here. And by here I don't mean just a place, but this event or place time. When he is here, B must see A as having also gone through the event horizon because the only light that he can receive from A at that event is from along this path. Now it's obviously trivial to say that when B is through the horizon he sees A as, as having gone through as well because that surely must be the case. B is following A in its journey and so if B is through then B must have seen A go through in front of them. And that may well be obvious but in a minute we'll get to something else a bit like that which is perhaps not so obvious. Anyway, forgetting about B being here, if we focus on the event or place time when A is at this event, having just gone through the event horizon, if they look back to see where B is, they will not be seen to have reached the event horizon. They would be still some considerable distance behind here. In fact, even when A is just about to be annihilated, very near to the singularity, it will seem to them as though B is still a good distance away from the event horizon. Fair enough, I suppose, if B is behind A. However, what about when B is just about to be annihilated at the singularity? Now, the only light that they can receive from A must have travelled along this path from when A was at this event, and so B will see A as not yet having reached the singularity even though A is in front of them. Now that should strike you as strange. B, the spaceship that's following A, is about to hit the singularity, but the light it receives from A, which is in front of him and on the same journey, shows A to be as happy as Larry, still approaching the singularity. That must be a consequence of the extreme warping of space and time near the singularity, as well as the fact that we always see things in the past. Perhaps a way to think about this is to ask the question, not where do they see one another, in other words, thinking about light signals, but where are they at a particular time? And if you do that, you'll have to remember that simultaneity is different in the red frame and the blue frame. You'll also have to remember that the red frame inside the event horizon has time measured using the hyperbole, and we won't try to explore that. It's a good gymnastic mental exercise if you want to think about it. Sticking, however, with the light signal discussion, it would seem that throughout all of this, what one person sees of the other appears to be asymmetrical. However, of course, it's all in the mathematics, and if this kind of diagram is true to the mathematics, then it should explain everything. We just have to read the diagram correctly and interpret it straightforwardly. All of these things happen on account of these strange coordinates and the velocity of light being constant. And the Kruskal diagram does give some insight into why things happen. What we'll think about next will show even more of the benefits of using these Kruskal coordinates to explain or to illustrate some of the bizarre findings that we had thought about earlier. To that end, let's now consider two observers, A and B, one of whom, A, is travelling into the black hole as before, but the other, B, is being held at a constant distance from the black hole. The one-dimensional picture could be something like this, where this diagram is meant to illustrate how someone using the red coordinates might see things. The observer B could be said to be at rest in the red frame of reference, and A is falling into the black hole, inevitably to end up at the singularity. B, on the other hand, in Newtonian terms, is resisting the gravitational attraction of the black hole by firing its engines, and is hovering at a fixed distance from the black hole. That's Newtonian thinking. In general relativity terms, however, we would say that A is free-falling and travelling on a geodesic, 
whereas B is accelerating. Using our Kruskal coordinates, we can map out this situation, which could be represented like this, where once again the blue Kruskal coordinate axes have not been drawn in, as they are easier to imagine. A is once again represented by a straight line with a slight bend in it, in freefall, heading towards the black hole. The object B, on the other hand, must follow the path of a constant value of R in the red system, which now looks like an hyperbola when plotted in Kruskal coordinates. They're both shown in brown and they are labelled A and B as before. The brown hyperbola is the trajectory of spaceship B at rest in the red coordinates. Let's first consider what A sees from various parts of its journey as it looks back at B. And of course we will draw all light lines at 45 degrees in the diagram in the upward direction. If A is at this place and time and they look back, they see B behind them at this place and time on the hyperbola. If A is just about to go through the event horizon, they see B at this place and time. And finally, if A is through the event horizon and just about to be annihilated, they see B here at this place and time. In all these situations, the observer A sees B seeming to move further away from them at all times while he continues to travel on to the singularity. Observer A has no particular sense of the event horizon or the black hole except for tidal forces when they come into play. So that's what A sees when looking back at B, back in space because B is hovering behind them, but also back in time of course. And that all probably makes a good deal of sense, even without general relativity. Now what about the other way around? What does B see as they look forward in space to A, who is in front of them? Remember that the observer B thinks they are stationary in the red RT frame, and that it's A that's moving away from them towards the black hole. If B is here at this place time, and they look forward in space, but obviously back in time, they see A here on its way to the event horizon. If B is here, then again they will see A here a bit nearer to the event horizon. When B is at this place in time, it will probably seem to them that A hasn't moved quite as far forward as B might have expected, but is still heading more slowly towards the event horizon. Now, unfortunately, I can't really draw the next thing I want on this diagram, so let me talk through it. Remember that all of these red hyperbole are asymptotic to the event horizon way off the screen in the upper direction here, as is the brown trajectory of spaceship B. They all get closer and closer to the line marked here as red T equals plus infinity, which is a 45 degrees. That means that if we were to plot this brown hyperbola of B's journey on and on upwards, it would get closer and closer to the thick red line of T equals plus infinity, but never reach it. So try to imagine some place time up there, way off the screen. If B were to be there, and they were to look forward in space, but back in time to observe spaceship A, they would see it just about to enter the event horizon of the black hole. In fact, you can go on and on with this brown hyperbola, and observer B who is on it will always see A just about to go through the event horizon. In other words, someone in the red rest frame, the spaceship B in this case who is hovering at constant red R, can detect and measure the object A, which is travelling towards the event horizon, but will ne never actually see or measure it actually to have gone through the event horizon. Now we knew that from the Schwarzschild mathematics, although we didn't prove it for an object with mass, and we illustrated the result of that mathematics with a plot of the position against time for an object travelling towards the black hole. Its velocity went to zero at the event horizon. However, the Kruskal coordinates have shown the same thing in a different way, in what seems to me to be a clearer way. 
the use of crustal coordinates in this visual approach can be very helpful in interpreting situations near a black hole. They allow us to analyse many different kinds of situations, perhaps with many more observers. All we have to do to find out who sees what or who measures what is to draw lines at 45 degrees from one place to another in the upwards direction, forwards in time, and the crustal coordinate plot will tell us more or less what's going on. The upshot of that last discussion simply confirmed what we already knew, that somebody in the red rest frame, say a spaceship B which was hovering at a fixed position in that frame, would measure spaceship A in front of them, travelling towards the black hole, as never actually reaching the event horizon, even though spaceship A would experience an unhindered journey through the event horizon. Okay, so that concludes this simple discussion of crustal coordinates. However, as with all the space-time diagrams we've drawn so far, even before Kruskal, we could only see or rather plot a limited portion of space-time, and the black box around the diagrams has been an indication of that. Space-time, of course, is infinite, so why should we expect anything different? We can't expect to be able to plot the whole of space-time for the space around a black hole from r equals zero to infinity, and for the time to encompass minus infinity and plus infinity, we can't expect to be able to plot all of that on one diagram. Or can we? Well, as we'll see in the next video, number 16, Penrose diagrams are a way to do just that, to squash the whole of space-time into a single finite diagram. And as we'll see, it will point to some interesting speculations. This video has discussed crustal coordinates, which keep the velocity of light constant on a space-time diagram, but they don't include all of space. In the next video, number 16, we'll move on to thinking about Penrose diagrams, which will encompass the whole of space-time in a single diagram. Mm -hmm.